Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Carrillo. Today, we have Lane Koaaka. Lane currently has ownership in 4,200 plus units across the US. He lives in Hawaii and recently quit his job as a professional engineer. So thank you so much for being on the show, Lane. Yeah, thanks for having me, Charles. Appreciate it. So you have a very interesting background. You're working W-2 and now you're you're full-time in real estate. Is that correct? Yeah, I did a passive investing along the day job. Uh, barely worked there at the end, but yeah, it took me about a decade to get out of the rat race. Okay. Awesome. So what was your background prior to starting, uh, going full-time into real estate? So I was a civil engineer, industrial engineer, um, project manager, did a bunch of construction progress projects, uh, a lot of, uh, not vertical construction, but more horizontal construction, moving dirt around mm-hmm. building railroads and, and city streets and that type of stuff. Okay, cool, cool. So why did you choose initially uh, a decade ago or so to get into real estate investing? Well, I was sort of like an accidental landlord. I was living in Seattle at the time. Um, again, following all this like mainstream financial advice dogma to buy a house to live in, because that's what everybody said you're supposed to do, just like to get a college degree and all. Um, but I was never home because I was traveling all the time for work as most young professionals are you're the, the, the person they they shove out there as a road warrior so i you know i spent a couple of years to save up 80 grand to buy a house in seattle and then i'm never there right because i was traveling all the time for work so i just realized yeah maybe i'll just um rent it out right i mean if, if it was today i'd probably be doing that turtle thing right with my car right <laughs> just utilizing unutilized assets better but I started to realize that, um, you know, the rents being brought in were 2,200 a month. The mortgage was 1,600 to a young 20 something year old kid. That was a lot of beer money at the time. And then I started to realize like, wow, if I just keep doing this a few more times, I'll definitely get myself out of the rat race. And, uh, that's where all this, this idea kind of spawned and, you know, start just bought more and more properties after that. Nice. So what is your current investment strategy and criteria when you're looking at deals? Yeah, so currently I invest in syndications of private placements as a credit investor, the little single family homes that I got up to 11 of those turnkey rentals back in 2015. Great way to get started, but, um, and definitely for guys under quarter million dollars net worth to get started, to get your net worth up there. But I, you know, as I'm a credit investor today, it's just not scalable. So I like to sprinkle my funds no more than 5% of my net worth into mm-hmm. any one deal over different asset classes, different business partners, different operational um, asset or business plans. And um, most of which are workforce housing, multifamily. Mm-hmm. And this, you know, I think we kind of beat these markets up like Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Arizona, like those types of Southern belt markets. Okay. And so when you're going into a deal and you're saying that, um, well, the reason, what was the reason for you that you went from turnkey into, into syndications? Yeah. So when I had 11 rental properties back in 2015, I had maybe an eviction or two every, every year from one of these Mm -hmm. properties. Um, and some kind of big catastrophe that happened every quarter, such as like a tree fall on the house or, um, like a plumbing repair or like a storm came and kind of washed out a side of the house. Um, not a big issue, right? Cause you know, we're using third party property management on these and, you know, they take care of a lot of the dirty work for us and a lot of the headaches, but you know, with 11 rentals, you know, that's, that's what happens. And with 11 rentals, maybe at few hundred dollars of cash flow per property, you're looking at maybe $3,000 like passive cash flow a month, which is great. Mm-hmm. But I don't know what American family can survive off three grand, right? You're yeah. going to need more like $10,000 is what most people talk about. So multiply that by three to get 30 houses, multiply those exception rates by three, right? Mm-hmm. So now you're talking about an eviction every other month, some kind of big catastrophe that happens. And just you start to realize it's just not scalable. Yeah. 
And, yeah. and that's yeah. where I started to get around other high net worth accredited investors. And a lot of them used to own rental properties and they might say that it was a vital step. Some say it was a complete waste of time, but today they are investing in private placements and syndications. So you started passively investing after that, is that correct? Into syndications? Right. That was kind of how I got started because at the time, you know, as with, you know, just taking the step from being a, a, a landlord where you can feel touch your properties as I was in Seattle going out of state, you know, mm-hmm. to go into a private placement, sign this 150 page document, you don't know what <laughs> half of it means. It's a big step, right? Um, so it took me about 18 months to finally get enough courage to go into my first deal as a passive. And that's kind of how I first began. And it gave me the opportunity to kind of see things from the inside. You know, what, what are things that as a passive investor, I want to see, right. To gain that empathy for what a passives want and eventually started to run and operate my own deals. Okay. So what, what are you, what were you looking at as a passive investor? And I love that criteria about the 5%, because that's actually something that uh, I work off too, you know, not investing more than 5% of my net worth into any single idea or deal. Yeah. So I kind of break things down like half, half. Um, So 50% is the sponsor, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a softer, more quantitative analysis or qualitative. Yeah. The quantitative analysis is more on the number side. So I'm actually able to underwrite deals by taking the profit and loss statements, rent rolls, and kind of putting it into my analyzer and running at the deal on what assumptions I think that deal should be able to do. So in other words, I can decode the code, where it's, I would say most passive investors don't have a clue how to do that, which is why they likely re- rely on, well, was he a nice guy, right? What do <laughs> other people say? Yeah. Um, so the way I do it is I underwrite the deal. I see what kind of assumptions that they're going to make. And if I don't like what I see, I'm not wasting my time even talking to the sponsor at that point. Yeah. 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 Do you, so you take their underwriting and you put it into your own program or you manipulate their underwriting? Yeah. I mean, that makes it easier. Right. Yeah. I mean, but if not, I can just take the raw data yeah. and kind of run it on my own. It takes a little bit more time, but you know, I, I think that's what you have to do before. I think most investors get to a point where you just have a network of other pure passive investors around you and you mm-hmm. you have organic relationships with these people and you kind of trade off who they're working with, who you're working with, and you kind of do test investments with operators. Right. Yeah, that's a great way of checking out operators. Uh, I've done smaller investments with operators um, before partnering with them, even on an active role to kind of see how the communication is, because I feel that one of the biggest things that past investors and I've past invested uh, before, and it's just the lack of communication, I think is the biggest problem that I think a lot of passive investors have, and they don't know what's happening, right? You just, you find out maybe some people talk to you quarterly, some people talk to you monthly, some talk to you more often. So it's something that I talk to my investors more often on that, because I feel that that's something that kind of lacks, but what did you have issues with your first syndications or your, your passive investings that you did before? Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I kind of, things went off pretty smoothly. Maybe it's because of the due diligence process or just maybe just got lucky. I mean, my first deal I went into was back in 2013 and that deal didn't go well. The guy kind of just ran off with my money. Oh. Uh, it would probably be a failure, right? <laughs> what we're talking about. But, you know, in hindsight, what, what did I broke the cardinal rule of never invest with somebody you don't know, like, or trust or have like a, that golden referral from, right? I mean, what I mean a golden referral is like have someone that you know organically and you have a real relationship, not some kind of loose, you know, I had a beer with at one time, but a true relationship with somebody that actually invested 50 grand with somebody else, right? So many people, you know, just kind of have these loose referrals like, oh, so-and-so is good. Well, have you ever invested with them? You know, possibly not, right? And that's not that gold level of standard. But when you're first starting out, you're not going to have these people in your corner as I didn't have in 2013, which is why I invested with the wrong person, right? But, you know, if I would have known now or known who the people my network today, I wouldn't have invested with them. But hey, that's all part of the process, right? It helps yeah. me build my network in the future because not everybody know, wants to know who not to work with. Yeah, it's a funny thing too, like when we used to go to conferences and everything, um, you'd go to some of these guru conferences and you'd be talking to people there and everybody, 
you, you would think that no one ever lost money at all that was on the stage or anything like that. And I think people then that are there are like, wow, I mean, I can invest anywhere. There's so much money to be made. You can't lose money. And um, it could be with any type of sponsor that they find on the floor, right? And they're investing with, and uh, it's completely it's completely wrong. But um, so other than having an organic network, how else do you suggest limited partners to vet potential sponsors? Um, learn how to analyze the deals on your own. Mm -hmm. That's surely the way I think. I mean, numbers, numbers don't lie. People do, right? Yeah. Sponsor, I mean, talking to sponsors, in my opinion, is kind of a waste of time because mm -hmm. everyone's going to tell you what they what you want to hear. I mean, I can tell investors what they want to hear in my sleep at this point, right? But it's, like, like, re oh, it's like referrals. You're right, right. I mean, but if you don't have the referrals, right, that's what you have to work off of is yeah. the, the data, the, the raw numbers, um, the rent, rent rolls, profit and loss statements of the properties, especially if you're going mm -hmm. into stabilized assets with a running track record of you know profit and loss statements. If you're going into development deal, well, that's going to be difficult to verify that, right? That's where you really need to rely on track record or, or referrals. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the first things I look at when I'm looking at any type of underwriting, if it's something that we're going to be active on or if I'm passively investing, it's uh, looking at their rent assumptions of what they think that their rent is going to go to from what it is currently. And also seeing what kind of downtime they have during this whole repositioning pro process. Because I feel that people are like, oh, we can do you know X amount of units per month. And you're like, if you do X amount of units per month um you know you, your your cash flow is you're not gonna be able to pay out any type of returns you know what i mean for the first couple of years so there's a lot of things to look at even if the numbers at the end look fine it's uh, kind of the process of how they're arriving at it that i found as uh, right, being right. an investor and, and that's what it is to be a good astute passive investor and lp right like you're not going to be an underwriting specialist but there are things that you can possibly uncover in the pitch deck, even though the most pitch decks don't have this to determine, is this business plan makes sense, right? Like to kind of, to your point, like if I see rents being increased more than 20%, I kind of scratch my head a little bit. Yeah. Not saying it can't happen, but I'm just a little bit more worried. Like, all right, well, maybe are they making sure that their occupancy taking a little hit in the beginning as people give them the middle finger and move out and they start <laughs> to bump the rents up that much? I, I've seen some before that said they're going from $500 to $800 a month. And I'm like, well, now every person in that property is now moving out because there's not going to be anybody that stays there that's going to have uh, you know a 50% rent increase. So Right, right. And, um, and these are not, not like rules, right? But it's right. like, you know. Hmm, interesting. Now let's dig into that a little bit. Let me do my own comp analysis mm -hmm. and figure this out. But unfortunately, most passive investors don't have the data, right? I mean, they could pop maybe the at best go to Rentometer or um, check out the websites of other competing properties. But you never know. I mean, these these properties all show well, right? They all pretty pictures. You don't know if the comparable is a true comparable. Mm -hmm. If the exterior is pretty nice, but the interiors look like junk, right? It's yeah. not a good comp. And, I think that's where ultimately you have to trust your operator to are those real comps. I mean, in the end, they're just shooting themselves in the foot if they're being overzealous with those rent increases and they're just going to make passive investors upset with them in the future. Um, but I know, I mean, it's, it's hard, right? It's yeah, kind of like yeah. a marriage. You don't know what you're getting yourself into until the wedding bells go off and you start to get into it, right? In terms of, yeah. You know, you mentioned communication to me, look, I don't care what they're telling me every month. Just get me my results. And, and I don't want to see results in six months to a couple of years. Right. Right. Yeah. I, the worst thing I see is like people giving me these really good thorough reports every month, but the damn thing doesn't perform. Yeah. yeah. You know, go spend your time, stop writing me emails and go and, and get on those property managers. So when did you start going active in syndications? Did you do a number of different passive deals and then you got a little bit more active on it? Yeah, I actually went active pretty early, but I was had a pretty secondary role in a lot of it, but which allowed me to kind of learn vicariously in the jump seat. So I got to um, kind of sit jump seat to a variety of different partners. And, that, and I started to realize a lot of this is just it's like, I guess, like most things, right? If you know what to do or more, more importantly, who to call in case of something happens, that's really all that it is to mm. be an asset manager once you get into operation, right? I mean, most people think that they can be a general partner 
I would say, no, you can't, <laughs> right? You can't raise the money. You can't get the deal flow, right? The, just to take that one aspect, you know, getting deal flow from brokers takes most people 18 months to build up an organic right. relationship with a broker. And at, the, at that point, they have to get lucky because they don't have a track record of closing 100, 200 unit properties at that point. Um, yeah. But as far as operation, that's, I think that's the most learnable part. I mean, people ask us all the time, hey, can we get involved in operation? Like, no, there's not much to do there. <laughs> we don't need you. And, yeah. and especially we don't want another cook in the kitchen too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, when we split up the asset management, there's going to be someone that's going to have contact with the property manager. And if there's renovations going on there, there's going to be someone that's going to be handling a lot of project management, but you can't have like three people talking to the property manager, right? I mean, they're going to be right. like, who do, who do I send these updates of evictions to? And who do I send reports to? And who do I tell that this is an issue? But um, yeah, that's very interesting. It's, it's also amazing too, when you're talking about with different being resourceful, it's very important, I think. And I also talk to a lot of passive investors. I'm like, do you really want to be active? I mean, I, I, personally for me, I mean, it's much easier being a passive investor or doing it unless you have a real, uh, if you really love, if you really love real estate investing. Yeah. But um, so when you're finding new operators, you're telling us how you vet operators kind of as a passive investor. How does that, is that pretty much the same thing that you're doing when you're vetting investors as a, um, when you're planning on joining a general partnership with them? So when you're becoming more active, uh, what are you looking at anything different than you were when you're just planning on going passive? Same, same process, right? Like, I mean, it's the filtering thing for me. I don't have time to talk to people, right? Mm -hmm. First, right? I, I go by the numbers first and I take a list of 20 and I cut it down to two or three. Mm -hmm. And then I have a conversation with those people. So it's, it's just a, it's just a filtering process. Um, but it's just kind of the same the same thing, whether I'm looking to, to be LP or general partner. I mean, to these days, I kind of go off of my network primarily. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, I'm kind of just giving people practical advice because most people don't have a network. They just listen to podcasts all day long and they don't interact with people, the right people, right? High net worth right. accredited investors. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, as you know, I do, I do a lot of apartments as operating, but when I get some outside my realm to like office space, uh, industrial self storage, you know, like I'm outside of my wheelhouse. So mm. it's, it's, I'm kind of just like an LP at that point. So I'm following the same process as I'm doing every day. I'm always talking to people, but I'm going after passive investors first, right? Cause they have, they have the data. So I need to go, I need, instead of wasting your time of talking to all these random sponsors, I would say focus on the long game, which is building your network of a pure passive investors. There you're going to find the people who are, you want to work with and also the people you don't want to work with and then kind of work from there. Yeah. Yeah. It's really so counterintuitive, true. but I mean, I, I think that's just the more long-term sustainable way of doing it. Yeah. Cause it's amazing. Cause uh, since I've been in it, I've been talking to other people and they tell me, Oh, I just reviewed someone's underwriting from so-and-so and super aggressive and this or that. And when you start having your, when yeah, you start, you start using your network as uh, making more decisions than just relying just on the sponsor or on the information they're sending over in, in, you know, like I'm not going to call a sponsor's referrals that they give me because that's obviously we know what they're going to say. You know what I mean? Um, I want to speak to someone else, like you said, that um, has invested with them um, and uh, kind of what they saw after 24 months or 36 months where it was. And, uh, you know, I just want to kind of see how that, how that person works. Everybody has their own. I think every different general partner has their kind of own uh, style of how they deal with passive investors and how they deal kind of with everything going forward if there's an issue. And um, you kind of want to learn that and make sure that you're comfortable with that because uh, that's really like you're saying a marriage, it could be five, seven, 10 years, you know what I mean? That you're going to be involved with this person uh, on a monthly basis. So. Yeah. And, and kind of to, to, you kind of mentioned something there I saw recently I don't know what it was like a Facebook post, but like people were talking about getting references for an operator and uh, personally, I don't do that. Right. Cause uh, let's think about it from the operator standpoint. I mean, if they, if these random investors are coming up and hitting up your three to 12 guys you use as re references, it's going to be turned into a second job for them. 
Yeah. Right. And not only that is like their personal information is sort of out there. Um, you know, I have a kind of a policy where I don't give references unless somebody is net worth 3 million or above or 4 million or above. Right. I, I just don't do that. It's just like, look, man, like I'm out there. You can, I have a lot of events to come and meet my guys. Do, you know, I'm not going to make this easy for you. I don't need your money. Right. I don't need somebody to come in and kind of take, you know, review. I don't, I don't reveal the identity of my past investors for their own privacy. Yeah. Right. And if that's, it's a, that's a, a game a breaker for you, then I'm sorry, but like, or I guess I lose out, but yeah, I, I, I was like, yeah, who what like, it's always like the non-accredited investors too, yeah. that like kind of think that they're entitled to references. I was like, dude, you're kind of a dime a dozen. Even the guys that are one to $2 million net worth, mm-hmm. um, you know, go build your organic relationships on your own and, you know, do this the right way. The other thing too with that is uh, uh, I get that as well from is uh, not, not so much anymore, but I used to, it was uh, lowering minimums when you're investing. And, uh, and that was like, Hey, you know, I would invest, but it's going to be like, I can only do this. And you've already spent a lot of time with them. And it's usually always, you know, non-accredited investors that are, Hey, you know, trying to lower where you're saying, Hey, the minimums here is 50,000 for an investor for investment. And, uh, oh, you know, I want to come in, you know, I had some, you know, they come to me and say, Hey, you can do 15 or something like, I can't, you know, come on, man. Like it's, uh, we're, we're, you know, it's already been filled up. Like you're not going to go, <laughs> you know, so it's just completely crazy. I get that. But I find the most sophisticated, wealthier investors that we work with, they're investing more in the sponsor than in the deal. And usually the money's not really a thing. They kind of had set that aside. It's really just knowing that you have the vision to manage the deal and whatever happens in it. Because like my dad has uh, passively invested, not in real estate, but in other types of private placement memorandums and uh, in deals. And um, he like lost on one deal and he reinvested and uh, did really well in the second one that were there for like 20 years into this deal. And um, it was, it's amazing. I was like asking him, he's like, well, you know, the guy was had or, you know, and you, you listen to what it was. And my dad was investing in the sponsor. He wasn't investing in the specific deal. Right. So we knew that this guy was going to have a home run at some point and just reinvest it again. And a lot of investors aren't like that. Obviously, they're going to say, oh, no, man, this is a terrible deal. This guy doesn't know what he's doing. And then he did another deal and it was like that. So I think it's just that the more sophisticated the investor is, the, the wealthier the investor is, I think that you see a lot more on just a sponsor and it kind of deals off to the side. But what do you see with that? Yeah, I mean, I think the more sophisticated and usually higher the net worth, the yeah. investor, the more grown up they act, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like... They, they're kind of invest, they, what they, what I normally see people do is they'll invest in a few deals just to try it out, get some data points. It's nowhere near like maybe 5% of their net worth, mm-hmm. you know, to do that. Um, they understand the price is the price. They don't haggle on it. Um, and, and I always tell a lot of non-accredited investors, like, just don't do that, man. You already label yourself as a pain in the butt. I mean, a lot of these CRMs, you can just tag people appropriately as annoying. And as soon as the deal fills up, you know, you conveniently get left out of the deal. Um, and it just, I think it, if people don't realize, they think they're interviewing sponsors, but it's also the other way around. Sometimes it can complete, put completely the opposite way around where they don't need investors and they're interviewing you. So it can quickly, it can quickly get, get you out of a deal. I mean, we've had deals where things don't go well and it's a little rocky in the beginning and we we find out who we want to work with long-term, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't do this for money. I, I kind of just do this for kicks a little bit and to meet cool people who think uh, very similar to me and like, you know, that's likes about like taking some calculated risk here, but, and you know, when everybody's trying their best, working hard, but when you find people with their true colors, right? The pre- person who had that nice onboarding call but then, you know, six months later, when things are a little rocky, they're the one like just kind of being a jerk, <laughs> yeah. right? An a hole. Um, yeah, they just, you know, they, they just yeah. don't get invited the next time yeah. to the party. 
Yeah, they're being deleted off the uh, the deal list. I've done that before too. The other thing too is, uh, and then before can we wrap this up, uh, a couple last questions. But it was uh, I had one investor once, and I was like, hey, just you know, they they contacted us, and my assistant sent out an email I'm like, hey, find a call, find a time here, set up a call with Charles, and he's like, no, I got to talk to him right now. I got to talk to him. I'm like, this guy's out of here, man. The guy can't wait 24 hours to do a call. He's not even an investor. And I was like, it's completely imagine that down the road when you're hitting, uh, you know, you hit 11 percent return instead of 12. And I've got to deal with this guy calling me all day long, telling me that, uh, you know, it's something went different than what he expected. And, uh, you know, just, it's amazing how, and obviously a non-incredited investor as well, but so what mistakes do you commonly see newer experienced real estate investors make? I think they look at like the split structure or the fee structure. I mean, that's important, but you know, if a deal is fatter, right, it's a better deal. I think the general partner should ratchet up their splits, their splits and fees. Right. It only yeah. comes down to what is the performa at the end of the day, right? If you put in a hundred grand, what, do I, what is my expected cash flow? What is my performa? Set expectations there. I want you to hit it as a passive investor, right? I mean, I think people get wrapped up over this fees and and, yeah. and splits a little bit too much. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's I, I get I think it's important to keep it within a reason, right? Like there are deals out there where the acquisition fees are kind of astronomical, like five to 8% sometimes. And they're kind of hidden in different types of fees, but it's all acquisition fee at the end of the day or at the close. Um, keep it in reason, right? But I mean, I, I think I think what you get in trouble is when these you have semi-sophisticated investors and there's such rules they want to see happening, right? Like they want to have the sponsor have 20% of the capital stack of their money in the deal or whatever, 10%. You know, they're just, they're not rules, they're kind of guidelines. And, you know, I mean, if a sponsor is very, you know, more to the institutional stage, they're not putting any money in. They have a track record, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Maybe they're rolling some of their acquisition fee into the deal to the passive side, but um, they're probably not putting up too much more than just some at-risk capital initially. Yeah, they don't need to. They, yeah. They, Fees are a big thing. I, I, that's a great thing too, just not to get off on a tangent here, but uh, the fees are another thing. I have people that just like, they go through and they're like, really like 2% or 3% of the acquisition fee. And you're like, you know, 2% is usually what we charge, but as it's getting harder and harder, I'm like, yeah, I mean, 150 deals, we got to look at to find this deal. You know what I mean? That's a lot of underwriting. That's a lot of brokers to email. That's a lot of, that's a lot of deals to review, you know? So I think that, uh, yeah, looking past the fees, I think people get really hung up on the, on the small things and they're not looking at the ultimate business plan for the property and the amount of time and work it actually takes to find a deal that actually pencils. Um, but uh, so what factors have you and your team implemented in your life and your business that have led to your success? Um, just make small steps and execute. I think that's the main mm -hmm. thing. I mean, just constant effort. Um, you know, leaving day jobs behind and focusing on a full time and becoming a true professional. This is what we do 50, yeah. 60 hours a week. Nice. So how can our listeners learn more about you and your company? Um, they can check out kind of my background uh, at simplepassivecashflow.com. Um, kind of started the podcast originally talking about rental properties, turnkey rentals. But then, you know, I kind of talk more about like high net worth strategies for the wealthy um, mm -hmm. You know, tax legal. The deals are a part of the of, of everything. I think the deals allow you to get the passive activity losses to now manipulate how much taxes you want to pay. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd say two thirds of it is the taxes, the legal, infinite banking. You know, the other strategies. And unfortunately, um, I think the deals is what attracts most people to the, the you know this financial independence world. And it certainly uh, accesses, you know, to unlock these tax benefits, but um, there's a bigger world out there to truly pull this all together holistically. Okay. Well, I'll put all the links to uh, your podcast and your information into the show notes. So thank you so much for being on today, Lane, and look forward to connecting with you in the future. Yeah. Good crowds. Appreciate it, man. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hi guys, it's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at schedulecharles.com. That's schedulecharles.com. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars Incorporated exclusively.